and uh, what Welcome to this, uh, to this session, uh, going into more details of what is the EO score. For, for this, we have a presentation by Klaas Wieringa, and we have an, uh, an excellent panel to, to discuss questions. And I hope that there is some, some interaction by the audience as well. So I will keep a, keep a close look on, on the chat and the, and the questions. Let me briefly um, briefly introduce uh, on so give a brief presentation on the EOSC future. Um, it's it's a large project now taking place, and and its goal is to realize this EOSC. Uh, in, in a nutshell, it is uh, realizing an operational platform consisting of the data, the services, and uh, also open research products. And it, uh, it, it, its goal is to be accessible, easy accessible, and to be used by, by researchers from Europe, but also from, from other countries, continents. There are, in EOSC, there are three key items. The, it is this EO score and exchange, and we will focus on this EO score in this uh, session. But it's also about integration of data and resources, and it is on the involvement of users on, on co-design. I'm going to show uh, a, a complex picture, but uh, which we call the fishbone. Uh, on the top, you see this EO score and also some other technical uh, uh, te technical uh, focus on what is called EOSC exchange and the interoperability framework. But we also take in the science clusters the, and, and the scientists to, to provide an, uh, data, to provide with new tools and services. And on the right-hand side, you see the involvement that we plan to have with the, with the users to engagement, engagement, engage them in the, in, in the, in the project, but also uh, see what are their needs, what do they want to do uh, and, and expect from this EOSC. Perhaps more easy overview, uh, and I, I borrowed this from class, so perhaps the picture will come back. Just to clarify, where is this EOS core? Yes, it is in the, in the core. It is uh, the basic functionality that we will provide within the EOS. And for me, I want to give two examples on, on this AI and, uh, and the metadata from, from the social sciences uh, point of view. And, and the first one is uh, on the shop project, which wants to realize the social sciences, humanities, and cultural heritage part of, of EOSC, where we deal with a lot of sensitive data. So we have a need for authentication authorization. And this is already existing. We know it's uh, existing in the life sciences, where they also have these confidential data, but also at the, uh, the e-infrastructures. And in the project, we, we have uh, one topic, one, one sub-project, on access management for distributed research infrastructures. And mind you, 80% of all the S3s are, are distributed. And uh, we, we also see uh, shop versions in other, other continents, other countries. Uh, in Australia, and we, we have Steve McGregor from Australia on this uh, humanity, art, social sciences, and uh, indigenous data initiative. And also in the US, there is an initiative by the American Social Data Archive, uh, setting up a research data ecosystem, also dealing with sensitive data. The other example is the metadata office or dealing with metadata at uh, SESDA, which is a distributed social science data service. We, we have our data catalog taking uh, metadata every night from, from 25 plus uh, data repositories. And we base these metadata on, on a DDI standard. 
And yes, we have ontologies, we have to multilingual tisauri, but for example, two years ago, there was nothing in it uh, on COVID or Corona or infectious diseases. We also need to check on the metadata quality and we are developing tools for that. So this is all happening in the back, in the back office, but we can check on the quality of, uh, of, of, of these metadata. And for this, we want to set up a metadata office uh, where we share and combine the expertise we have on the metadata from our 23 uh, current member countries. So with these two examples, I want to conclude and give the floor to Klaas, who will take us into the details of EOS core. Thank you. Klaas. Yes, and I should probably also unmute, like I told you uh, just before. Um, you see my slide now, I hope? Not, not yeah. yet. Not yet. Hmm. If you try sharing, it doesn't look like anything's trying to share yet. Yes, oh, yeah, now ah. we do. Yeah, good. It uh, it had my computer had to think a little bit uh, about this. Um, yeah, so so uh, Ron uh, says that I will go into much more detail. Um, well, I have about a quarter, so it will not be that much detail. But um, if you want to get all the details, I uh, I encourage you very much to reach out to me, and uh, I, I'd be happy to uh, to tell you more about it. Um, you also may notice that uh, I use an old uh, slide master. I noticed that Ron ha nicely had the grand agreement number there, whereas for me it is still a, a yellow thing. I will uh, I will fix that after this uh, this call. Um, so so Ron showed this picture, and uh, and called out some of the important elements of it. Um, I, I want to to take one step back and explain what it is that we are building in, uh, in the EOS Future project. So uh, you may have, uh, have seen this, um, this diagram many times. It's, it's output of the, um, uh, the EOS executive uh, board uh, in, the, in the three r document. And it, it talks about these different layers of EOS, where there is an EOS core, um, that contains all the basic functionality, EOS Exchange, where the, the clusters and other communities come in, um, and the wider community, if you want. And uh, in principle, the EOS Future project is about building the EOS core, as also the, the title of the session uh, suggests. But what we are doing is, is more than just building the, the EOS core, because we strongly believe that we need to demonstrate uh, incremental value as we go. So uh, we are not uh, going to deliver in, uh, in two and a half years time an EOS core and say, okay, now good luck with it. But we want, as we go, we want to have input from the community. We want to work with the community to show to, that every couple of months, we demonstrate that we're making EOS just a little bit more reality uh, as we go along. Um, so that's why we've been talking about a minimal viable EOS. Um, basically, everything that you need to demonstrate the value of having an EOS core and uh, a subset of, of services that, that make that uh, make that visible. Oh, maybe I should go the other direction. Um, what, what you also uh, may have noticed in, uh, in Ron's uh, short presentation is that a lot has happened. Ron gave the example of the social sciences community. Um, uh, the same could be said for the proton and neutron community uh, that we have Rudolf for, uh, for the panel for. The same can be said for the... Um, the uh, nuclear physics uh, community, uh, for, the, uh, for the health uh, community, etc. There is already a lot. And um, uh, we have no intention to try to replace what is out there and what is working and what is functioning well. Instead, we want to combine what is all there into a, an overarching EOS, but, but 
as I said, not by replacing what is there, but by in a smart way combining what is out there. Um, so the, 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 the concept in computer science is course, uh, uh, called the systems of systems. And I think that very well describes what we're trying to do. We are federating existing systems as much as possible into one uh, and add the, 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 what I call glue layer to, to make that uh, a reality. Um, that also... Uh, should give you an idea um, as to what the focus of the project will be about. Uh, we will not be uh, building massive amounts of, uh, of services and data, et cetera. Uh, instead, it's, uh, the focus is on how do we reach agreement on what data looks like. Uh, Ron mentioned ontologies and metadata. Uh, those are key concepts of the, of the EOSC Future project. We do need to build a bit uh, of, of glue. There will be some, uh, some development going on, but a lot will be, as somebody uh, said in, in a meeting I was in last week, I hope it will not all be talking and, and little doing. Well, I think we will be doing a lot of talking in the, in the coming years, and we want to talk to you. We want to understand what we need to do to make your resources available in EOSC, uh, and we will provide that that glue layer that I was talking about. Um, I, I've, in my my talk so far, I, I think I've mentioned it uh, maybe between the lines a number of times. We do want to demonstrate incremental value, uh, and that means that our technical roadmap. We have a high level technical roadmap that talks about functionality for end users. As we progress through the through the project, that is completely driven by the requirements for now of the the clusters that are involved in the EOS Future project. But we want to be uh, the EOS core for everybody. So uh, again, if you have specific requirements, we want to know about that. We want to make sure that we address what you what you need. To, uh, to support the researchers in your uh, community. I keep pressing the wrong uh, arrow. Um, and to do that, we, we have um, created an architecture. Um, I, I will not go into uh, all the details of this architecture, but those that have um, read the SRIA document or have seen the output of the architecture working group under the uh, EOS executive board will notice that this is very similar. That's not a coincidence. Uh, well, for two reasons. For one, uh, it, because uh, the people that um, uh, created this architecture are very much the same one that, that did it for the, uh, the architecture working group, but also because it just makes sense. It contains all the elements that are, are needed for, uh, for building this, uh, this federated infrastructure that I was talking about. On the bottom, you see the, the EOS core that has things like configuration management, uh, um, maintenance, uh, the, the AAI that Ron was also uh, referring to, and, and many more things. It contains a fair amount of sets of agreements uh, on, on interfaces, on what, it is, what is needed to, to join uh, EOSC, um, uh, what, what resources are looking like, how they are described with, uh, with um, uh, persistent identifiers, et cetera. Um, and on top of that, we have the layer that we call the horizontal execution layer. And that is a mix of, of services that are valuable for multiple uh, communities. So you can think about a, a large file transfer service that has been developed by the life sciences community. There is not much specific about a large file transfer service. Uh, so that kind of service can very well be used by other communities as well. And so, so we want to create a layer of those uh, I, I guess you could call them middleware services that can that everybody can use. Um, on top of that, then in turn, you see the different communities and uh, and cluster projects and region, regional projects, etc. And what is important to notice is that 
we are not aiming to destroy communities. On the contrary, we see the value of communities. We want to maintain what works there. We just want to, and I, I'll get back to that uh, soon, we just want to make them better. We want the community to be stronger, to be able to use more resources, etc. Well, then to the left, the, the yellow big uh, box is the is all the, the necessary support that you need to do to, to get people to understand how to connect, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to get them to provide their resources in EOS, to train them and educate them, etc. All these kind of things. Um, and to the right, in the, in the green or teal, I think um, women would say, um, you see uh, what I think, and I hinted to that before uh, already, what I think is the most important part of what we're doing, and that is the interoperability framework. That is the set of agreements on protocols, uh, metadata, ontologies, uh, uh, AI, uh, uh, persistent identifiers, et cetera, that allow, allows a researcher from one community to find, use, uh, make available again resources from other communities and ideally as we progress in the project also combine resources and services from multiple uh, communities. Um, now it doesn't respond. Yeah, there we go. So uh, very briefly um, uh, when we talk about interoperability framework uh, what we have identified so far uh, are the um, are the elements you see to uh, to the left um, uh, things that are needed to tie the different communities and the and the resource of those communities together uh, the uh, agreements on how to access data platforms uh, uh, computing services etc and that is very much created by bringing together in the EOSC future project on the one hand the e-infrastructures that have, have been uh, active in projects like ARC and EOSC Enhance and EOSC Hub, et cetera. And on the other hand, uh, the, um, the thematic clusters that are represented in EOSC Future. And finally, there are sort of um, parallel to, to the EOSC Future project. There are the so-called uh, uh, 07 uh, projects and the cluster projects that do similar things uh, on, on a regional level or that develop um, uh, content and, and resources uh, specific to one, uh, one area like high performance computing or data, uh, et cetera. Uh, so what that looks like um, from, from a researcher point of view, because I think we need to keep in mind that that is in the end uh, why we're doing this. Um, we are to make, uh, make life better for researchers, allow them to, to get, to create a high quality uh, research. And, and what, uh, to go back to the system of systems approach, we have these organized communities, we have uh, clusters, uh, we have big science projects that, where researchers already have a working relation with each other, where they already have, as, as Ron mentioned, for, uh, for shock and SESTA, where, where there is already a common AI that allows uh, a researcher from one organization to, uh, to authenticate and access resources in another organization. Um, so they already have uh, often a, a community platform with a portal and all kinds of tools and APIs, et cetera, uh, connected to it. And what we, what we want to achieve is that that community will uh, make their resources and, and potentially services available uh, in the, uh, under the EOS core uh, platform, uh, make all those resources part of, a, of the EOS uh, resource catalog, and if other communities then do the same, then in essence, everyone that was in uh, community platform A, the one to the left, will uh, still have all the resources and services available that were always there, but all of a sudden the platform will look a lot bigger because also the resources and services from the second community platform become available for that um, 
for that community. Um, and then uh, lastly, uh, of course, um, even though there, there's quite a bit of, uh, of focus on this idea that individual researchers will directly interact with EOS, uh, we believe that that is, is a minority. We believe that the majority of the researchers will work in the context of their existing collaborations, but there are emerging uh, communities that don't have all this community platform available. Uh, we have uh, citizen science researchers, and, and for them, there is absolutely a value in having the EOS platform directly available, and we will make sure that we create a portal, etc., cetera, to, uh, to make that uh, possible. So my last slide, uh, in case uh, people get a little bit uh, nervous, um, my last slide, it, it tries to um, explain uh, high level what life for a researcher will be if uh, once the uh, once the EOS future project starts to deliver, and um, and what we start with is, is something um, relatively simple, uh, or or maybe I should say uh, relatively simple because, and that because is because there have been in the, in the past um, almost 10 years by now, a lot of efforts into uh, harmonizing authentication authorization infrastructures uh, in, in the ARC project, the ARC2 project, uh, uh, federated identity management for research, et cetera. And that has led to an architecture called the ARC blueprint architecture that is adopted by almost all of the bigger uh, research community. And because we have that, um, having a, an AAI that spans multiple um, uh, research communities becomes uh, kind of low hanging fruit. And because, but uh, so, so we focus on that initially and that will allow preci precisely what I said, researcher from one community can access resources from another community uh, without having to have uh, new credentials or whatever, it will be seamless. And, and, and that is what we will be focusing on, on the, in, in the first uh, couple of months of the project. And, and we, have, we are pretty, pretty much there by now. Um, but as we go in the project, what a, resource, a researcher can do becomes more and more complex. Uh, they can orchestrate data and services from different uh, infrastructures uh, and, and e-infras. Uh, and, find, and towards the end of the project, we have this, uh, this execution framework that I mentioned in the architecture slide, and, and that allows for completely fully integrated end-to-end uh, -end workflows. Um, we're a long way from there, uh, but, but as, a, as a direction of travel, that is where we, uh, where we want to go. Um, I think that was it for me. Yes, that's uh, what I had to say. Okay, thank you, Klaas. Um, thank you for this presentation. So, so basically we are talking about uh, one core and yes, in EOSC, uh, we will have a portal, one of the portals and there can be many more. And the idea of this core is to make this uh, connections and, and provide it as a, as a service to all of these, these portals, if, if I may summarize. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so we, um, we will we'll start now, or continue with, with the panel. And uh, we have uh, a number of questions prepared and you can see the, the panelists uh, that are in, they will briefly introduce themselves. And uh, I want to start in Australia with Steve uh, and ask him the first question. How do you interpret the EO score and how can it help you from your community perspective? Okay, th thanks Ron. Um, I, just say, I appreciate the invitation to uh, uh, say join the panel today. Um, I also sort of want to acknowledge um, uh, the uh, Indigenous peoples uh, uh, on land, whose land I'm speaking here, here in Australia, the, the land of the Ngunnawal people. Um, so just being not acknowledged there, um, uh, acknowledge the, the, the Indigenous communities uh, who have uh, uh, um, who's on whose land I speak. Um, the my name's as I said, I'm Dr. Stephen Keck from, from the Australian Data Archive at the, at the Australian National University in Canberra. 
Um, I'm running two projects, which are kind of relevant to what's there. So um, I say at the moment, um, we are actually uh, involved in a project with the Australian Research Data Commons, um, who are establishing a, a humanities, arts and social sciences and indigenous data um, research data commons. Um, and that project is to some degree modeled on the shock program that, uh, that Ron was uh, mentioning earlier. Uh, and fundamentally, it's uh, one of Australia's early attempts to establish a thematic data commons. Um, so we have a, a number of interests in um, picking up on one, some of the thematic uh, commons are doing uh, in the EOSC program. I'm also a uh, chief investigator on a project uh, entitled Coordinate Access to Data Researchers and Environments, which is actually a project looking at how do we facilitate um, information exchange on secure data um, services. Uh, fundamentally, looking at the five safes model that we have for uh, um, exchange of uh, uh, sensitive research data. Um, uh, leveraging what had been done particularly in the UK and progressively uh, elsewhere. So we, interestingly, you know, uh, how, how do we interpret the EOS core and how, does it, how is it relevant to communities that we work in? It kind of works in a number of ways here. So I say I come from the social science community um, who have a long tradition of thinking about data exchange and, and particularly engaging comparative social research. Um, so uh, as, as many of you are aware, as Australia is a, is a member country of Europe, or at least um, uh, the, uh, um, uh, uh, I've now forgotten, the, the Eurovision uh, likes to say so. So, so we, uh, um, so we, we have, a, we have a, a long and, and, and long history, certainly, and a, a strong connection to Europe. So there's certainly a strong interest in exchanging um, data and knowledge from um, the European communities, say a large proportion of our, uh, our, our origins are uh, embedded in Europe. So the, the basis on which we are interested in um, leveraging and, and exchanging data often looks to, um, the, looks to Europe uh, and looks to uh, the US to be able to draw upon resources. And increasingly those uh, resources are um, increasingly sensitive uh, in, in nature. Um, so Ron touched upon the, the sensitive data needs uh, of, of the community that we have. This is where a number. So this is where both of those projects that I mentioned, you know, come to play. So we've been looking at, for example, the 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 Arc projects and the, and and its um uh, as its successes um to look at a framework for how we might implement um AI services um and sort of the core services that are there. They both provide a means through which just, um, international researchers and, and researchers in the communities that we work in might uh, engage with. Um, European services, but also a model on how we might go about implementing services in our own countries as well. So, you know, rather than focusing on something that we might do, you know, here on our own in, in Australia, um, which we have some tradition of doing, increasingly we're looking to how we might at least uh, frame the services that we're establishing here, leverage the services that might already exist, and those interoperability services in, in those various ways are, uh, are important there. Um, but increasingly then think about how we embed um, those services into the practices uh, within our communities as well. Uh, and, and certainly um, we already have well-established exchanges. Ron mentioned the DDI um, uh, Alliance and the, the metadata exchanges that we have there, but increasingly looking into some of those foundational core services um, the, the, the access infrastructure, the persistent identifiers infrastructure, a lot of what we're increasingly building into our, um, our infrastructures and our workflows here are, are, are not going to be, you know, solely Australian based. They're really, you know, looking to engage with um, uh, core services uh, and really picking up on a number of the models that the, say the, the um, EOS core um, is really bedding down here. Um, so no longer do we look to try and you know work on a um, you know a national model. Increasingly, um, a lot of our uh, uh, our implementations are well, you know, what's already around, what's already exists, and how does this facilitate some of those international exchanges? Okay, thank you, thank you for 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 now. We'll come back to you later on. I want to to move on to Natalia. 
uh, from open air. But, uh, I think everybody knows you, but perhaps a, a one line introduction and then ask, uh, answering the first question. You're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, so I'm Natalia Vanala and I'm the executive director of Open Air. So uh, let me, I, I will try to be short because I would like to also, you know, have a discussion on the other items. So, um, so plus when, when I heard your, um, your uh, presentation, it was uh, EOS core and the clusters. So that means that it was uh, the way I would perceive it is that uh, the big guys are just getting together, the big infrastructure, the big data science, uh, to, to put uh, things together. From our perspective from open air is that uh, I will not be speaking as open air providing services, but I will be speaking on behalf of, of the members who are universities. And most of them, they are dealing with long tail of science. And many of them now, they are in the business of setting up either institutional infrastructures or, you know, becoming part of the national infrastructure. Uh, 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 also representing these underrepresented communities in in in, in the big uh, in the big uh, European S3 um, uh, uh, landscape. So so for us, what does it mean? So you talk about interoperability. Yes, this is something that uh, Open Air. Well, you, we started from publications, repositories in, in institutions, uh, publications, repositories who are becoming slowly. Um, uh, uh, data repositories, either at again, you know, at the, either at the institutional level or the the, uh, the national level. And what we have found, you know, in the past, that even for the long tail of science, when you don't really dig down, uh, deep down into the into the into the into the nitty gritty parts of the interoperability, uh, we always had a problem because we, even the basic stuff they were not applied. Um, so what we see EOS core building, first of all, is, um, is a language about uh, linking everything together. So interoperability is key, but it's also a language. It's, it's also something that it brings uh, from, from, from the political level. Uh, it's uh, EOS can EOS core uh, will allow these um, institutions to make some commitments. And these commitments can come from, from the data repositories, uh, but they also can come from the ARC, because you said, you mentioned, for example, the ARC uh, framework, which is there for some time now. But if you, and, and you mentioned that um, uh, big research institutes are, uh, are, have adopted it, but many universities still have not adopted it. And this is a challenge. So even that is a challenge. So, so what we would like, so how, how I would interpret EOS core and the community perspective of the long tail of science of universities of libraries is, is just to bring this interoperability, but into very, very, very practical terms. Uh, not, not, not um, uh, even in the light way, um, linking an association of what is being there produced. So that's what I would like okay. to say. Okay, thank you. Uh, before I go to the next panelist, uh, perhaps Klaas also, you want to respond to Natalia? Yes, uh, yes, thank you, uh, Ron. Yeah, so, so um, two, two things, uh, one, um, if I created the, exp the impression that EOSC future is just about uh, creating an environment for the big guys, then that is my mistake. That is definitely not the, what I try to bring across. What I, the reason I mentioned the clusters uh, on a number of occasions is because they are partners in the EOSC future project and they will make sure that uh, what I guess I would call a flying start by having a significant amount of resources all in one go. If we are unable to serve that long tail of science that you were talking about, the individual researcher, the small research communities, then I think we have failed. EOSC should be for all. Um, and and, and I thank you for, for raising that because it's definitely something we need to keep 
aware of. It's one of the reasons why we also have a strong uh, collaboration with the EOSC Association, because the EOSC Association does bring in uh, a much uh, broader community. So, so uh, thank you for, for raising that. Um, maybe for um, Steve mentioned ARC, I mentioned ARC, Natalia mentioned ARC, uh, maybe very briefly explain what this ARC blueprint is about. Um, the, the, the ARC project was an answer to a uh, to a white paper created by a group of uh, researchers that, to put it very bluntly, said, you uh, NREN identity federations, you suck, and it's for this and this reason. Um, and, and that fim for our paper uh, led to the NREN community and the research community to get together and develop a, 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 an architecture that would uh, support, in particular, the so-called virtual organizations. I, I know this is a grid term, but I still think it's a very uh, apt uh, term. So it allows you to take researchers from multiple universities, multiple countries across the globe, and create an, an organization, a virtual organization that behaves like it was a real organization. So you can have roles in the context of your research collaboration. So when you say this is hard for, for individual universities, uh, Natalia, the, the nice thing about an ARC blueprint uh, uh, compatible architecture is you don't need the university for that. They use their existing academic credentials. They, they authenticate to their own IDP. And with that existing credential, they can participate in this, uh, this research collaboration. Is it perfect? Okay. No, because there are still lots of institutions that don't have a proper identity management solution, et cetera. And we're all hard, working very hard on, on, uh, on, on solving that. In the meanwhile, we do allow for things like ORCID uh, logins to, to be used uh, in, in an ARC blueprint architecture or, or God forbid, Facebook identities, etc. But 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 just for to give you a bit of context, this is where we already can collaborate uh, very well. So okay, I hope thank that you. Well, yeah, and uh, I think this uh, it's it's very relevant for research communities uh, that, that where you have these people from different universities and they do want to work together and they want want to build up uh, some some relations or even hierarchy. Um, I want to continue. Uh, you also mentioned clusters, so I, I will continue to, to Rudolf Dimper. Uh, he is in the synchrotron in Grenoble. Um, and um, Rudolf, same question for you. Please brief introduction and then the first uh, question. Yeah, thank you very much, Ron. So it is a real pleasure for me to be you, here with you. Uh, so uh, my background is chemical engineering and I'm working uh, since uh, now you know, 34 years at the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility in Grenoble, France. And, uh, I'm German. And, uh, at, uh, uh, in Grenoble, at the Synchrotron, we have more than 35 nations, uh, nationalities coming together and, uh, and operating this large analytical facilities to which uh, thousands of uh, researchers come every year for carrying out experiments, which are small, uh, sometimes large. They produce sometimes small sets of data, sometimes very large sets of data, but I come back to this. Now to the question, what is uh, the EOS core for me? I would uh, like to give it a little bit of different in, uh, in color, which is normal. So this is the uh, advantage of having different panelists coming from different corners. I would say that the EOS core is something like an operating system, in, uh, which uh, allows to implement basic functions which uh, are needed for researchers to do something with this computer, which is called EOS. Now, obviously, the core functions are to log in, that is CAAI. It is to find stuff. There is a browser which allows to find the data sets. There is a tool which allows to transfer data. And then there are applications which allow to visualize to analyze, combine uh, data, uh, and all this on what uh, is uh, a data common 
called the EOSC. Now, uh, what in, uh, does this, has this done for us so far in the, from the research communities? First of all, since we are talking about in a, in a, in a fair data, and actually we have started in a, at the ESRF and the photon and neutron community before actually this term fair was branded. Now we realized how important it is to manage our output in a, in a, as professional as possible, meaning that we in a, in a try to manage the data that it is well described, that it is archived, that it can be re-accessed and reused, and then not only by the initial research team, but also by others. So fair data management is really a basic function of EOSC for us. Now, the interoperability, which then comes on top of it, is something which has been implemented now in the in photon and neutron open science cloud in the project PANASC and has to be enlarged, but is more of a long-term goal and will certainly need huge investments in time and money to really see the benefit of it, that it really works. But it's something which is definitely very, very important. The other very important thing is that uh, our users, when they come to the ESRF, the European Synchrotron and Grenoble, they are not only coming to us, they also go to other places and complement the research by other, uh, with other tools. This may be a second synchrotron, it may also be a neutron reactor, it may be actually a laboratory, an, an experiment, and they have to combine these data sets. Obviously, this is very tedious if you have to do it on your own, if you have to carry the, uh, the data on disks and then combine uh, them you know, on your PC, and it becomes impossible when the data sets become so large that it is uh, in a, in a real in a challenge to write them to USB disks, which may be, by the way, then not spin up anymore once you have done this. And so combining data is already for the community a very important function because we, in the, the community, the researchers, the teams, they use different tools, different analytical facilities to come in for their research. Uh, this all, just to, to give the context, this all to understand how our world functions, you know, how the matter, how matter, our bodies, our proteins, but also in a, in a hard matter is actually structured and how it works. You know, so this addresses, of course, all sorts of uh, societal challenges as well. Now, uh, the access to the data is not only for that very important, then of course, it's very important that uh, we know what has been done in the past. This leads back to peer review. Now, of course, the access to an analytical facility, which is big, like, in a, and you see that in the background, in my background, it's a big facility, is very expensive. So the access is governed by merit, by scientific merit, and that implies peer review. Peer review uh, needs data to judge whether the new proposal is not already something which has been done, whether it actually is complementary to what has been done in the past. And this needs to be judged by the reviewers and they need data for this. So what they need to have is access to metadata catalogs to go through and judge actually what this new proposal, how this actually is situated in the scientific landscape. Now, maybe one more aspect, and then I'll shut up for a little moment because uh, I don't want to monopolize too much uh, in, uh, in my time here. Uh, so uh, the, uh, we now start carrying out very sophisticated experiments, uh, which uh, are very complex. So the data sets are more and more complex and become very, very large. So although we try to help our users to reduce the data and often do the first step in the data analysis, the final data analysis is not in our remit and it must be in most of the cases it's, it's done when the researchers go back home. That hits increasingly a wall because of the size and the complexity of the data 
uh, generated in our facilities. Now, this is why researchers need IT infrastructure and more and more of it. They must have access to compute, to storage, to data transfer easily and seamlessly, not through another peer review because that you know, would take months. You know, we are very often and more increasingly these days you know, in front of emergencies like COVID, like the pandemic, things have to be done very quickly. So EOSC could be the vehicle to allow, you know, if we figure out how to do that, you know, that researchers have access to IT resources to work with the data we you know, supply to EOSC and you know, supplying data to EOSC. This is what happens now. We are filling up our data catalogs with thousands, hundreds of thousands of data sets and for different experiments, and this represents petabytes of data. Thanks. Thanks a very lot. Next. Okay. Thank you, Rudolf. Um, so, from from the virtual organizations, we now we move to the the, the requirements on data or the, the, the idea to combine data to have the platforms to work on the data. You also mentioned the, the, the reviews and there is a question in the chat by Marcus Conkel um, saying, I often hear that reviewers have already too much work and don't have the time to look at data as well. So what about that? Uh, fully, uh, fully correct. We do have a, a, a significant problem with the reviewers, in particular because of the sheer size of our operation. And, uh, our poor reviewers, they have to review some thousand proposals every six months, and, uh, just for our place, and we are just one and, uh, of the analytical facilities in Europe. And, uh, so and, uh, there is significant stress. This is why I'm, I did not say that the reviewers will look at data, they will look at metadata. This is what is really important. So they will look at you know, the teams which have already worked, you know, uh, what you know, the metadata you know, of the data sets contain, what the you know, conditions were. You know, if, for instance, just to judge whether the proposal you know, actually redoes, does again a similar experiment, but under completely different conditions. This is what is important. Hmm. So, okay. and it's totally correct that this has to be extremely efficient to reduce stress on the reviewers. Okay, thank you. And um, there is a new question also on citizen science communities. I'll, I'll come back to that question uh, in a minute because uh, Rudolf, you also talked about communities, talking about communities and talking about one of the biggest communities. I want to, to shift to, to Hillary uh, uh, as she is leading Research Data Alliance, which I think is perhaps the biggest community uh, there is. So, Hilary, to you, a brief intro and uh, answer to the first question. Sure. Thank you, Ron, and thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to speak on behalf of one of the biggest communities. Thank you for, uh, for that title. Uh, the Research Data Alliance, which um, is uh, indeed a, an international, global, and uh, multifaceted uh, community. Perhaps a, a little short history for those who don't know it, but the Research Data Alliance was um, founded, launched, I suppose, in 2013 by uh, funders uh, in the US, Europe, and Australia. And it has a vision that uh, researchers and innovators openly share and reuse data across technologies, across disciplines and across countries to address the grand challenges of society. And so a rather grand, uh, important vision, complex vision for which, you know, the European Open Science Cloud is uh, fundamentally important. And the, uh, the, the, the mission, if you like, and the way the Research Data Alliance works is in fact to build what we call the bridges, the social and the technical bridges. We put equal importance on both. Um, the technical outputs are important, but the actual social connections are fundamental to build trust um, and to build collaborations, of course. So um, I suppose, what do, how do, I'll get on to what RDA can do for and support, how we are supporting in the context of the Ask Future project and uh, generally more be towards in, in one of the next questions. But in the first one, 
So how do you interpret the ESC core? I suppose I, I would say the engine um, for me, it's uh, analogies. I think we did this once before, so I don't know if we want to go down the road of cars and things like that, but fundamentally it is uh, for from my perspective, an, an, an engine, uh, an engine that needs to work well and needs a, a significant amount of engineering and uh, building and also sustainability. Um, so it is something that long term will need to to be, um, if you like, sustained and maintained. Um, so what is the how can it help from our community perspective? So the Research Data Alliance, as I said, is an op it's very open organization. It is, uh, we look at its domain, domain specific, but also uh, domain agnostic solutions from for all different, if you like, uh, aspects of, uh, of, I suppose, the open science vision. So, of course, the work that's being done in Europe is fundamental for, um, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a piece of and a benefit for Europe, but let's talk about the rest of the world. And it's fundamental, of course, for other uh, scientific communities and other initiatives of a similar nature that are happening. I, I, I think it's probably fair to say that uh, the European Open Science Cloud, at least to my knowledge, is the most advanced. Um, and therefore, there's a lot of experience and uh, skills and knowledge and, you know, uh, failures and testing and documentation that the uh, global community can take uh, stock of. Um, I think there are models as well for communities uh, that are, you know, less developed, have less opportunities and less funding for this sort of thing, and that aren't up to the same speed, because we're all looking at the same, if you like, uh, open science vision, yes, and science is global. So, of course, if we can uh, su uh, support it. So, EOSC Core and EOSC in general and the EOSC vision is um, somewhere, something that can inject new ideas, new challenges to the community, um, which they can, of course, leverage on the Research Data Alliance to support and make available and avoid this duplication of efforts, which is one of our main goals. All of the outputs of the Research Data Alliance are, of course, open and available for reuse. So it's a, it's a, it's a really important opportunity, I think, for the Research Data Alliance community in Europe and abroad. And the European community is over 50% of our global community, interestingly enough. So we have over 12,000 um, data professionals in the network, um, of which 6,000 of them are based in Europe. So already a significant, if you like, um, basket or how would you call it, pool of, of uh, experts in which we can um, leverage and work together with. So I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Hilary. Um, I move to the next panelist is uh, Jan Meyer. Um, Please briefly introduce yourself, your organization, and uh, the first question then. Thanks, Ron, and thanks for the invitation to the panel. Much appreciated. Interesting discussion. So I'm Jan Meyer. I work for Norwegian NREN Uninet, and we're in the process of merging into a, I call it the full stack uh, shared service provider for Norwegian higher education and research. So it's going to be much like CSC does which means that we provide shared services to public sector Norway, uh, public sector r and &E in Norway <clears throat> uh, on everything from uh, the fiber optic network footprint that we have all the way up to in a couple of years, quite likely data management services. So what we typically do is um, we provide those shared services where it makes sense to do them shared. Uh, so we provide primitives that other people can build further on. Uh, in essence, you could say that we provide quite ubiquitous infrastructure uh, to all the researchers in Norway. So if you look at the, the, uh, the population that EOSC is supposed to serve uh, on a European level, that's about 1 million public sector researchers, and it's about 1 million private sector researchers. Of those, uh, 40,000 are in Norway in both sectors. On a Nordic level, it's about 250,000. Um, so what we're interested in is stuff that makes life of researchers, research projects, universities easier, but at scale. Um, and, and that leads to some challenges. So what we do is we provide the national um, infrastructure uh, of a global infrastructure. And this works because everyone is doing a similar effort. Uh, our promise to Norwegian researchers is not 
thou shalt have great internet or great other types of services, but you will be able to collaborate meaningfully with any researcher and any research instrument anywhere on the planet. That's, that's the vision that we're trying to reach. And so coming to EOS core, um, what, that, what we hope from a community perspective that that's gonna do, what we expect it to do is, I guess you could call it commoditize a rather complicated problem. Um, we roughly all know what needs to be done in order to really share research data across disciplines and across organizational borders, national borders. Um, we know what the technical complexities involved are. Class presented them uh, very, uh, very well. Um, fixing all that on a national level, that's not going to work. And besides, it needs to be agreed upon in the community view. If I try to explain EOSC uh, to people who are wondering, so what are we going to get out of it? I tend to say, look, we want to federate all research data and services that you can use on top of that to make use of that research data under one policy and technical roof. And that is a major challenge, but that's the only way that we can get it done. Um, so Hillary already went into the uh, the benefits that, that researchers expect to that uh, for addressing the big societal challenges that, that we face. Um, the job of my organization is to, well, provide the uh, nitty gritty uh, technical detail underpinning uh, making those grand visions work. You can't do data management if you can't shuffle the data around. Uh, that just won't work. So from uh, so so that's that's the stuff that we're trying to provide, and we hope that EOSC uh, will help us and our community with that with the EOSC core. That's where you can commoditize these services. That's where you can do things that were on our own too small to do, or that any of our 150 national research infrastructures are unable to do. And I think I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, I will move to, to Klaas also for this first uh, question. Um, Klaas? Uh, yes, uh, well, a um, very short introduction then maybe. I'm uh, Chief Information and Technology Officer of Giant. Um, and well, you've heard uh, me present kind of how I envision the EOS score, but but let me also uh, respond to the question from a Jayant perspective. Um, our what I believe our mission is is to make the national research and education networks, uh, forty of them that are our members, uh, successful, and and what we have seen over the the past 10, 15 years is that um, where there used to be a bit of a distance between what research communities did and what national research networks were uh, about, um, that, that has shrunk considerably in the, in the past 10 years or so. Um, Jan gave the example of how uh, Uninet split up and rejoins uh, again into a full stack, as he called it, uh, organization. You see the same happening, um, same happened at CSC in Finland, at JISC in the UK, at SURF in the Netherlands. And, and it, it is a, a trend that I think um, will, will, will continue. And that is bring all the uh, all the parties together that are needed to do both high quality research and high quality education. And, uh, and if all our members are going that route, then, um, then, then to put it uh, kind of in a, in a negative uh, sense, then Géant has to follow. Um, but, uh, but to spin it a little bit more positive, I think this is the right uh, approach. I think uh, today's complex problems or grand problems, as Hillary called them, uh, need a grand approach. And um, and Géant as the as the the infrastructure provider for the European research networks 
feel that we need to, to play an important role there. And that's why we got engaged in the EOSC Future Project. That's why we have uh, uh, someone in the board of directors of the EOSC Association. And, and, and that's why we are very much engaged with the community. We still have things to learn. Um, we, we have stayed away far, pretty far from data because there are other organizations that are much better at that, but we need to do that same integration. Probably not within our organization, but at the very least by having a very strong collaboration with other organizations. Okay, thank you. Um, there is a question in the chat by Gabriela Fizova. Uh, on the, how we envision the use of EOSC by citizen science communities. So to the panel, how can communities like citizen scientists uh, also make use of this core? Who wants to take that one? Can I, can I, uh, Ron, yeah. can I respond to yeah. that? Um, because uh, uh, we run in Open Air Advance, uh, the project that ended last year, we run a pilot. So that pilot was very, very interesting for us because what we wanted to see is how citizen science uh, um, projects or groups, they can actually use um, uh, services of EOSC. And when, when, what, what we mean services of EOSC is you know, mainly institutional or national services. So the example that I would like to present is that we had a school, uh, schools from south of Europe, uh, and they had seismographers um, placed in, in uh, the do-it-yourself seismographers placed in schools. What they were actually doing is they were um, uh, they, they were collaborating with the National Observatory of Athens, which is a part of a, of a, a member of, of the National of the Greek EOS. They were collecting um, all of the data uh, in, in a way that it was uh, because the National Observatory of, uh, of Athens is an EPOS uh, node. So they were uh, using the standards. So th these are the standards of the community. And then when they wanted to share with themselves, they use Zenodo. So what you could see is you could see the cycle of, of a community project using a national infrastructure the national infrastructure uh, being um, uh, compatible to a European infrastructure, uh, which you know it shows you the 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 um, uh, the, the whole uh, chain, and then of course they could use uh, services uh, to to publish the data and share uh, with them in in a sense that uh, it was more easy for them than uh, this uh, uh, this uh, very uh, heavy scientific uh, infrastructures. So what I'm trying to say here, Ron, is that. The science, the citizen science, because they're working on a local level, is, is that they should knock on the door of, of the institutions who, in their turn, should be the liaisons and the ambassadors to EOSC. And this is how I would view that. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps also other panelists, and if I may, expand the question and say, uh, if, if a research community wants to make use of core facilities, uh, where should they go? Um, how can they apply? How can they implement? Uh, I go to class and then to Steve and Jan. And I didn't even raise my hand, but uh, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, so 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 kind of as a as a follow up from what Natalia was just talking about, that, that was kind of the community perspective, um, and I on purpose uh, downplayed a little bit the the core um, interfaces to the outside world. Uh, I guess you could call it um, because. When we started, a lot of people thought that we were going to build the Uber portal that would uh, do away with everything else that uh, that existed. And uh, as I think I, I, I hope I explained um, well enough, that's not what we want to do. That is not to say that we are not creating central facilities that those that don't belong to a cluster 
can use. And I believe that the fact that we we have a uh, pan-European, at least hopefully at some point, global AAI that allows someone with credentials in whatever organization that is somehow connected to the Edugain uh, Global uh, Federation can use those credentials to access resources that are available to them. We will create a, a portal that can end that acts as an entry point for, for instance, citizens researcher or individual researchers that want to gain access to all of those wonderful open data sources that Hillary was, was talking about. So we are definitely creating uh, right from on top of the core a number of interfaces that individual scientists uh, can use mm -hmm. and for for me uh, the, to to have it as a simple simple approach if if a research community wants to make use of say the the ai that has been developed in the core they go to the eos portal and there you can find your way how to get uh, access to this fun function um I, uh, I I I guess the short answer is yes. Um, it, it maybe it, to to onboard a complete community with an existing AI is not that easy. So, but but let's say the portal is the first point of entry. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, talking about evolving as we go. Um, we do want to automate it more and more. We do want to make it possible for a community to onboard without too much or any human intervention. We're not there yet. At the moment, mm -hmm. it, there is a, quite a bit of manual agreement uh, in play where you have to agree on endpoints and, and protocols and yeah. attributes and all that kind of stuff. We'll get there, yeah. Yeah. When it get technical, but uh, perhaps later on, Sarah Garavelli can also join because she's reaching out to user groups too. But I, I go to uh, to Steve, and now I see Rudolf, and then perhaps Jan. Yeah, I yeah, I, I want to pick up that sort of that extension that idea on citizen science, um, as say, which is potentially contributors to the the scientific effort. Um, uh, uh, another theme that's coming through is, is questions around data sovereignty in particular and Indigenous data sovereignty. Um, we've been thinking about this in our cadre project um, as to uh, that there's a bi-directional relationship that probably needs to exist there between the, you know, in a sense, the originators of the data and the, and the all the way through to the core and then back out again. Uh, and how do we think about that? So, we, we hadn't seen a solution for this at this point in time, but a lot of the, the groups that we were engaging with who aren't in the, the institutional communities, um, but need to be able to connect researchers in, uh, not researchers, community members in those domains. And it's another version of that, which is how do I return data back to those who are actually the traditional owners of it? Um, so that's, a, um, I, I say it's more a challenge, I guess, to think about in the, you know, for those, you know, um, who are offering those those type of services is how do you enable members of those communities to engage there? And I say, I say and it's kind of the, you know, another way of framing that discussion around um, uh, citizen science. Okay, thank you. Um, Rudolf? Yeah, um, just to say, probably exactly the same thing, just with different words. And, uh, open data and uh, is accessed by citizens. And, uh, that's the starting point. Then, what is very important is that there is a uh, good mechanism, an easy mechanism, which allows the citizens to get in touch with the scientists, with the researchers who have generated the data. This is the most fundamental aspect, and, uh, simply to assist the citizens in their. No, no wish to understand how it was done, what was done. No, and I'm pretty sure that the researchers, the scientists are usually, at least I've seen, they're more than happy no, to engage in that discussion. So what we need is really this, uh, is, is, are the, the simple tools no, which allow no, the citizen science uh, no, persons to connect with the scientists and the researchers. Okay. 
then Jan and next Sarah. I'll, I'll just do some some wild future thinking. So uh, EOSC Core is essentially it's it's going to be a platform for research, right? So a European spanning platform. That means that once you have that platform in place, you could also start thinking uh, outside of the traditional ways in which research has been organized. So once you have a platform with a common governance and common technical standards, there you're you're bound to get a lot more dynamism, a lot more dynamics in that environment. So there's nothing that stops uh, a couple, a, a bunch of citizen science uh, uh, people to get together and establish a not-for-profit organization to basically do citizen science, not hindered by the bureaucracy of traditional universities, right? So that's that's the type of future that you could imagine. Case in point, uh, there's uh, there's a person in the uh, in the task force on on sustainable EOSC who's from Open Knowledge Maps. So. That's a nonprofit that aims at revolutionizing discovery. Uh, now, universities participate, but it's clear that what EOSC Core will hopefully enable is a much more dynamic environment for organizing science in many different ways than we've done so far. And I find it to be quite exciting, to be honest. Well, that, that's quite revolutionary, but uh, yeah, thinking, thinking ahead, that, that could be. Perhaps, uh, Sarah? Yeah, uh, I wanted to link back to what you were saying before, Ron, about what we are doing uh, in EOS Future, what we are trying to do. So probably you have seen that recently we have launched this call for researchers uh, because we wanted to form this EOS Future user group. And actually, I mean, we had a very positive uh, uh, response to this call because now we have of, uh, more than 200 active researchers uh, that answer to this call and the idea is to use this group uh, to create some focus group uh, to discuss uh, and maybe test and validate all the solutions that will be done um, in EOS future. So the idea of this group is really to bring them with us in this journey towards uh, uh, the end of EOS future to see if um, in the end, they are satisfied or they see any progress in what we are doing with the project. So that's something that I wanted to mention. Thanks, Ron, for this. Okay. And um, also continuing on, on the response by, by Klaas on, on how communities can, can uh, connect, can, can join. Um, I also want to ask this to, to, to Hillary. Uh, so Hillary, please. Yeah. Thanks, Ron. Yeah, so of course, uh, one of the roles, so RDA has three fundamental roles, I suppose, in the EOSC Future Project. One is uh, to manage a series of open calls and to help the people who are not involved in the uh, EOSC Future Project to leverage on RDA, but also on the different developments through uh, funding grants that are going out over time. Yeah, so that's one way. The second is international global alignment uh, to ensure that what is being developed in uh, Europe not only is, um, if you like, propagated or communicated to the world, but also what's happening in the world is also communicated. So it's a two way thing and, and there are a series of different initiatives and we try to coordinate them. And the third is the answer to your question is uh, in fact, the, uh, so Ordier's task is to help the underrepresented uh, research communities or those less well aware. So I think if I can answer the question in that direct way, uh, we know that the S3s um, and the research infrastructure is well established in, in Europe. Um, have perhaps, a bit, you know, they, they're coming to this from a, a longer term. There are many that don't understand it, don't know what the European Open Science Cloud is, what it can do for them. They might not be aware, but they might be ready for it, or they might not be ready and they may not be aware. So our role is to um, hold their hands and to also take a stock and advantage of what the research infrastructures over and the clusters and all that over many, many years have learned and are still learning to help and support this. So while, as Klaas said, you know, there are, we have the cluster projects working together with the e infrastructures in EOSC future, we, we need the other research infrastructures or the research, sorry, excuse me, the research and science communities also um, to, to be involved. So that's our, if you like, role and we will and we can and we should help, um, you know, the research communities in, in, in that, so. Okay, th thank you, Hilary, for, for this. You 
You also mentioned before the the bridges, and Natalia mentioned the the, the key role of interoperability. Um, looking at the at the clock and the and the questions, I would like to ask the panelists the the, the last question, uh, uh, which is about what can you, what can your community bring to your score? So let let's turn it around. And, um, Hilary, you still have your hand raised. I don't know if you want to start. But... I can, though. I I I, uh, I mentioned it most of it before, but of course, uh, well, the Research Data Alliance has, you know, the, the solutions that are available there. They're domain agnostic, but also uh, domain specific. There are quite a a number of them. Um, I believe that uh, some, not all of them, of course. Uh, could be very valuable to uh, the you know this and this journey of open science, open research, clouds and commons. Um, the activities that are going on. I talked about the calls. So the open calls uh, from is a way that uh, definitely the Research Data Alliance can help. And um, because it's a bottom up organization, of course, um, we, you know, it's the community that decides what the solutions uh, are, are required and what they should be. And we, if you like, facilitate that and make sure then that it's available uh, to, to the world. So I think that, you know, RDA can make a significant contribution in that sense. It can make this contribution to global um, alignment to avoid the duplication of efforts, the creation of silos. And um, as Jan said, I liked that very much when he said, you know, you want to make uh, let researchers do science anywhere, anytime. That is our vision. And um, it's not it's not an easy one to realize, but uh, definitely something where the Research Data Alliance should be put to good use. So that's our contribution to, I think, a very complex uh, issue that needs contributions from all, you know, from the the, the, the very very vast uh, landscape of players that have many things to give. So, in in that perspective, I think if I could say that, and then of course there's the standards aspect as well and best practices, um, and you know, there, which is probably a whole topic for another time. But um, given that if they are community driven and they are, you know, this validation and testing and implementation and maintenance then um, I think that those those are important uh, things also for the sustainability in the long term and the alignment. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned anywhere, anytime. That, that, that brings me back to Jan on this uh, scientific uh, or the science fiction perspective or the, the future perspective. So, uh, which may might be uh, become real and and not not so far away anyway. But uh, Jan, what what can what can your community contribute to the ES score? So, if uh, if I limit myself to the uh, Norwegian national community and look at right, so what what can we as a shared service provider uh, uh, mm -hmm. contribute and the Norwegian uh, research community? So, it's. It's helping figure out if the value add that EOS Core is supposed to be creating through the minimum viable product, uh, if that's a real value add, right? So we can we can use the national community and especially the fact that that where we have a single point of contact of aggregation for that national community, we can use that to verify uh, uh, the assumptions that are made in EOS Core. Does this really add sufficient value? Are institutions and, and research infrastructures willing to commit to that, to, to, to support that, to connect to that? Um, we can explore integrating EOS Core and national shared services, um, in particular on data sharing. We've come quite a long way with that. Um, we can explore how to make EOS exchange work, because as far as I understand it, that's still a pretty big question mark. Um, and the mechanisms, the platform mechanisms of EOS Exchange, those are part of EOS Core. Um, and last but not least, uh, we can help figure out how to do the funding models uh, for long-term sustainability of EOS in all aspects, right? So for the EOS Core, that's relatively straightforward. That's 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 kind of like a pretty rounded amount of money that's going to be required to sustain EOS Core. EOS Exchange is much more difficult. And monetizing data and how that's going to work, that's, that's a very big question mark. And unless we figure out how to make EOSC sustainable, 
then any research infrastructure or any university is going to be quite hesitant to put in a, a substantial amount of effort to link their future to EOSC. You're not going to do that unless you know that EOSC is going to be sticking around. Yes, talking about this, uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, talking about the sustainability and, and, and data, uh, the, the amounts of data, and I, I see Natalia nodding, so then, then you're next, Natalia. Um, uh, so, Natalia and then Rudolf on this sustainability and these vast data spaces. Okay. So, you know, I really appreciate, you know, Jan's uh, input because this is, this is where uh, the game will be played. So at, at, at the commitment, the national, and all of us getting together. So on the sustainability uh, part, uh, what I would like to say is that, um, hmm, okay, I'm not sure I can say much because this is, this is a top-down effort uh, on the EOS core, uh, but, but I think what we are building here is, is a great opportunity uh, for us, you know, for us to, you know, to make some risks, I wouldn't, so, so Jan, let me, let me rephrase. I wouldn't wait to see what EOS core brings for, for you. I would jump in and be a shaper of EOS core. So, you know, if, if you, if you make it your own from, from the country level, from the national level, then uh, we have a bigger chance of sustainability. And this is where NVENS come in, this is where NOAA, this is you know, where everyone comes in and the, the plastics. So this is, this is you know, we are in this together. This is, this is what I would say for the sustainability because no one can promise anything uh, in, in these days. Um, on, on what we are bringing, you know, can I go back around to the question of you know, what we're bringing? So from, from, from the open air perspective, I see two roles. So one of them is, uh, uh, we are providing because we are a partner in NEO's future and we are providing this thin layer uh, of, of interconnecting everything. So this is, this is where we come in, into place, respecting the interoperability of the communities. Uh, we are just building the, you know, the, this linked open science cloud, I, I would call it if you want. And then on, on the other hand, which is equally important, this is where our members come into, is, is, is the support, is what Hillary said, is the social bridges, but the social bridges in a sense that you know, they are practical. So in order for, for, for all researchers or all operators, or all the middle uh, people to use EOS, we need lots of training. And this is where we, we, we come together. And this is where um, open air, uh, the infras and, and the clusters come together, joining, we have joined forces in order to create uh, a, a trainer community in, in, and, and, and the infrastructure, the knowledge infrastructure, in order to make sure that um, th this knowledge is propagated and it's uptaken by, 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 by everyone. Because this is, this is, you know, let's not forget that, you know, we need people who know about the data, who know about the services, who know about the AI, who know about all of these things that you know, we're putting together. So this is where uh, in, in open air um, uh, we come in. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Natalia. Yeah, I th thank you for mentioning the, this human factor, the, the, the training and the knowledge and, and sharing expertise because infrastructures are more than just the, the bricks and the bits and the bytes. It's, so it's also the people that, uh, that have to come in. Um, but uh, I move to Rudolf. Uh, perhaps he has to, cont uh, to contribute more than just these vast data spaces. So Rudolf, what do you bring? Well, I mean, yeah, thank you. Now, what is our you know, contribution? Now, if our, if I define our as the S3 science clusters, I think the first thing which comes to my mind is fair data, fair data, fair data, and still fair data. So we have to provide the data to EOSC, but also the experts you know, you know, helping to you know, the users to do something useful with the data. That uh, means also that we prepare the workflows uh, and I think with all this we definitely need virtual coffee and biscuits and this is uh, <laughs> getting out of control here. Now uh, the uh, S3 science clusters we in our projects we are already building mini EOSCs and now now, our role is really together with CE infrastructures in EOSC future and all the other players 
uh, uh, to integrate all this, to make it a real functional system, which uh, is useful, usable and useful. Now, uh, this has to be done step by step, I think. We, I'm very much convinced that we have to do it bottom up, step by step and creates this, uh, what I would call the European data common. Now, uh, one thing maybe which, is, uh, which hasn't been so much emphasis, so I emphasized so far, and that is open science. Uh, what we must really all uh, keep uh, in mind is that we do this ultimately for open science. And why do we need open science? We need open science for trust trust in the scientific endeavor. Now, if people do not trust what scientists, researchers say, what they have found, then how can we explain them to get vaccinated, to reduce their carbon footprint, and maybe to adopt a healthier lifestyle? So the trust is fundamental, and for trust, we need open science. OK, thank you. Um... I move over to Australia, Steve. Um, yeah, I was trying to think, in, in, say, I'll, I'll talk about two communities. Um, one would be, uh, say, in a sense, the, the social science community as, as, as a, you know, and, you know, uh, having a, looking at a parallel style of, infrastructure, of thematic infrastructure to what's happening in Europe. Certainly, I think we, um, we can bring um, different uh, related problems and look to it, it provide, in a sense, um, some validation and verification of, of, of how the, the, the various tools and services, both at the core and at the, and the, um, uh, the thematic sp um, uh, level, uh, might come together. The second I would think of fundamentally is, as, as I said, in thinking about the core in particular is being outside the European Union, but being an, a, a natural partner for, for what's happening inside the, the OSCOR, um, I think is a pretty clear sense. So here talking about the Australian research and, you know, uh, research infrastructure community more generally, um, we have, you know, a, a pretty strong affinity with a lot of the, the, the practices and the, the, the uh, developments that are occurring. Uh, and so both as a possibly a generator of new, you know, and, and different sorts of problems um, that might be addressed by the core and also uh, as a test bed for trying out if you need, you know, how do you operate outside the, both the governance and the technical infrastructure of, the, of EOSC uh, and bring that back in? Uh, I think there's a, a pretty strong relationship there uh, that we can bring to the table. Okay, okay. Thank, you. Thank, thank you, Steve, and we will, we will come back to you to, to Australia on this uh, how how we can cooperate and as as Rudolf said do this together because I I agree you know, we have to build this bottom up. Um, finally, I want to ask Glass also uh, bringing uh, to to the core. You already explained a little bit in in the presentation. I also want to add one question for you. When do you think that EOS core uh, is a is a success? Yes, thank you, Ron. And I guess you're on to me. Also, in our company meetings, I'm always the last one because I talk too much. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess uh, I'll try to keep it short. So let me let me start with um, what Giant, or or I should probably say the Giant community brings to the table because it's really Giant plus the NRENs. And, and I think um, our biggest contribution. Is, is probably the least visible one. That's that's the plumbing uh, that uh, that we all take for granted. We all take for granted mm -hmm. that we have a uh, fast internet connection uh, that we can connect to other parts of the world uh, without any uh, any problems. So so we provide networking. Uh, we uh, we provide. Uh, sort of middleware services like, like Edurome and Edugain for trust and identity. Um, and a bit more specific to, uh, to the EOS core, um, we, we, one of the 
uh, ARC Blueprint compatible implementations, EduTeams uh, is uh, created and operated by, by Giant, and that is uh, propelling um, a number of uh, cluster AAIs and uh, and most of the HPC AAIs as well. So so that is where we we move into the uh, the virtual organization space, uh, if you want, um, and, and to uh, to add for specific for the EOSC Future project, we also do the pan European procurement for commercial services because we have a lot of experience with that. In, uh, in other projects. Um, so, so to your question, when is, um, when is EOSC and EOSC core a success? Um, I, I guess I'll answer that in two ways. I, I think uh, one of the uh, ways to show success if the infrastructure that we, we have built will solve some uh, grand societal problems. Um, I, I think COVID is by now uh, getting boring to talk about, but uh, wouldn't it be great if by combining all these scientific resources, by, by you being able to use all of them, we could, we could cure uh, some serious disease or something. And, and if, if I look at, at the work that is done, for instance, in Health RI in the Netherlands, then it is actually helping us to get close to, to curing uh, diseases. But, but, but I think we should not only focus on, on those kind of, of spikes. What, what, what I really think makes a success out of uh, EOSC is if the users come. Uh, this is a, let's be honest about it, this is a fair amount of technology push uh, where we, we get uh, funding to basically kickstart an ecosystem. But in the end, it's all about the users should come and not just because they are paid by Brussels to come, but because we solve their problems. That is for me, ultimately, uh, the, the success uh, criterion for, uh, for the EOS. Okay, thank you, Klaus. Thank you for the, these conclusions. And that brings me also to the end of this session. Um, I want to thank all the panelists, uh, Rudolf Dimper, Hilary Hennerow, uh, Steve McGregor, Nat Natalia Manola, Jan Meijer, Klaas Wieringa. I also want to thank the, the people in the chat for, for the questions and the organizers in the background, uh, Ilaria, uh, Sarah, and Sarah, and all the people of Open Science Fair. Um, and yes, uh, let's hope we can meet in one or two years again, but then live in some nice city instead of behind the uh, screen. So thank you for this and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.